Transmitting to you from Old Heart Radio. Hello, good morning. That's right, this is another episode of Coffee and Contemplation. It's perhaps your least consistent podcast. Most least consistent, really. Uh, as built. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that's that. That's good, I think. Good news? Bad news? In between? I don't really know. Either way, as always, I'm your host, uh, sitting down here, you know doing it all just thinking about it all but i you know whatever uh just hope you're doing good i just really want to quickly say uh hop on instagram and follow us at old heart radio follow us on twitter at old heart and space look up on youtube old heart radio i bet you will pop up uh you know that being said you can also find the podcast on itunes or spotify uh if you use those and uh you know Drop us a line. Say hi. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. That being said, let's just dive in. It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and and changed. With the brass nozzle in his fists, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor, playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. With his symbolic helmet numbered 451 on his stolid, on his stolid head, and his eyes all orange flame with the thought of what came next, he flickered the igniter and the house jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in in a swarm of he strode in a swarm of fireflies. He wanted above all, like the old joke, to shove a marshmallow on a stick in the furnace while the flapping pigeon-winged books died on the porch and the lawn of the house. While the books went up in sparkling whirls and blew away on a wind turned dark with burning, Montalg grinned the fierce grin of all men singed and driven by the, bla- by the flame. He knew that when he returned to the firehouse, he might wink at himself a minstrel man, burnt corked in the mirror. Later, going to sleep, he would feel the fiery smile still gripped by his face muscles in the dark. It never went away, that smile. It never, ever went away as long as he remembered. He hung up his black beetled colored helmet and shined it. He hung his flame-proof jacket neatly. He showered luxuriously and then, whistling hands in pockets, walked across the upper floor of the fire station and fell down the hole. At this last moment, when disaster seemed positive, he pulled his hands from his pockets and broke his fall by grasping the golden pole. He slid to a squeaking halt, the heels one inch from the concrete floor downstairs. He walked out of the fire station and along the midnight street towards the subway where the silent air propelled train slid soundlessly down its lubricated flue in the earth and let him out with a great puff of warm air onto the cream tiled escalator rising to the suburb. Whistling, he let the escalator waft him into the still night air. He walked toward the corner thinking little at all about nothing in particular. Before he reached the corner, however, he showed as if a w- he slowed as if a wind had sprung up from nowhere, as if someone had called his name. The last few nights, he had had the most uncertain feelings about the sidewalk just around the corner here. Moving in the starlight toward his house, he had felt that a moment prior to his making the turn, someone had been there. 
The air seemed charged with a special calm as if someone had waited there, quietly, and only a moment before he came, simply turned to a shadow and let him through. Perhaps his nose detected a faint perfume. Perhaps the skin on the back of his hands, on his face, felt the temperature rise at this one spot where a person standing might raise the immediate atmosphere 10 degrees for an instant. There was no understanding it. Each time he made the turn, he saw only the white, unused, buckling sidewalk, with perhaps on one night, something vanishing swiftly across the lawn before he could focus his eyes or speak. But now, tonight, he slowed almost to a stop. His inner mind reaching out to turn the corner for him had heard the faintest whisper. Breathing? Or was it the atmosphere compressed merely by someone standing very quietly there, waiting? He turned the corner. The autumn leaves blew over the moonlit pavement in such a way as to make the girl who was moving there shit! Shout out, shout outs to all you hot dogs listening. I love you, thank you for listening. Shout out to all of you participating in Old Heart Radio. Thank you. Participate in any way you want. We're welcoming everyone. Get out there. All right. Back to the story. Where were we? Holy fuck. Anyway. Letting, as, as a way to make the girl who was moving there seem fixed to a sliding walk, letting the motion of the wind and the leaves carry her forward. Her head was half bent to watch her shoes stir the circling leaves. Her face was slender and milk white, and in it was a kind of gentle hunger that touched over everything with tireless curiosity. It was a look almost of pale surprise. The dark eyes were so fixed to the world that no move escaped them. Her dress was white and it whispered. He almost walked the he almost thought he heard the motion of her hands as she walked and the and the infinitely small sound now, the white stir of her face turning when she discovered she was a, mo- a mo- moment away from a man who stood in the middle of the pavement waiting. The trees overhead made a great sound of letting down their dry rain. The girl stopped and looked as if she might pull back in surprise, but instead stood regarding Montag with eyes so dark and shining and alive that he felt he had said something quite wonderful. But he knew his mouth was only moved to say hello, and then when she seemed hypnotized by the salamander on his arm and the phoenix disc on his chest, he spoke again. Of course, he said. You're our new neighbor, aren't you? And you must be... She raised her eyes from his professional symbols. The fireman. Her voice trailed off. How oddly you say that. I'd I'd have known it with my eyes shut, she said slowly. What? The smell of kerosene? My wife always complains, he laughed. You never wash it off completely. No, you don't, she said in awe. He felt she was walking in a circle about him, turning him end for end, shaking him quietly, and emptying his pockets without once moving herself. Kerosene, he said, because the silence had lengthened, and is nothing but perfume to me. Does it smell like that? Really? Of course, why not? She gave himself herself time to think of it. I don't know. She turned to face the sidewalk, going toward the homes. Do you mind if I walk back with you? I'm Clarissa McClellan. Clarissa? Guy Montauk. Come along. What are you doing out so late wandering around? How old are you? They walked in the warm, cool, blowing night on the silvered pavement, and there was the faintest breath of fresh apricots and strawberries in the air. And he looked around and realized this was quite impossible so late in the year. There was only the girl walking with him now, her face bright as snow in the moonlight, and he knew she was working his questions around, seeking the best answers she could possibly give. Well, she said, I'm 17 and I'm crazy. My uncle says the two always go together, 
When people ask your age, he said, always say 17 and insane. Isn't this a nice time of night to walk? I like to smell things and look at things and sometimes stay up all night walking and, wa and I watch the sunrise. They walked on again in silence and finally she said thoughtfully, you know, I'm not afraid of you at all. He was surprised. Why should you be? So many people are afraid of firemen. I mean, you're just a man after all. He saw himself in her eyes, suspended in two shining drops of bright water, himself dark and tiny in fine detail. The lines about his mouth, everything there, as if her eyes were two miraculous bits of violet amber that might capture and hold him intact. Her, her face turned to him now was fragile milk crystal with a soft and constant light in it. It was not the hysterical light of electricity, but what? But the strangely comfortable and rare and gently flattering light of the candle. One time, as a child, in a power failure, his mother had found and lit a last candle, and there had been a brief hour of rediscovery of such illumination that space lost its vast dimensions and drew comfortably around them, and they, mother and son, alone, transformed, hoping that the power might not come on again too soon. And then Clarissa McClellan, McClellan said, Do you mind if I ask? How long you've worked at being a fireman? Since I was 20, 10 years ago. Do you ever read any of the books you burn? He laughed. That's against the law. Oh, of course. It's fine work. Monday, burn Malay. Wednesday, Whitman. Friday, Faulkner. Burn them to ashes. Then burn the ashes. That's our official slogan. And they walked still farther, and the girl said, Is it true that long ago, firemen put fires out instead of going to start them? No. Houses have always been fireproof. Take my word for it. Well, what a riveting tale of mystery and intrigue. I'm sure you can guess what book that's from because it's in the title of the goddamn podcast. That's right. Fahrenheit 451. If you've never read Fahrenheit 451, dear listener, dear hot dog, go out there and pick up a copy. Or better yet, check it out from your local library. Why? Because libraries are fucking awesome. And Ray Bradbury, uh, Fahrenheit 451 is a fucking essential, if you ask me. So, do yourself a favor. Read that sucker. Also... Go out there and use your brain for good. Ripen up that coconut every day you have one, all right? And, you know, spend the time making time to do so. It's important. Also, if you know anybody that likes to read, tell them to listen to this podcast. Old Heart Radio. Keep your stick on the ice.